play here, so we're just going to show them to you on my laptop if that's all right. That's perfectly fine. Great. Can you all see it? Fine. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Not a problem at all. Great. Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> um, okay. So for John and I, it's our third presentation this morning, so we I think we're warmed up. Um, Me too. Me too. Excellent. Rick is with us for the first one this morning. So um, I appreciate y'all done quite a bit of work to get here, and thanks for, for your effort and so, uh, in, in the work you've done. Um, uh, what we'll do is we'll introduce ourselves, we'll kinda, uh, and I'd ask you to introduce yourselves as well as we have a chance. Um, I'll read a brief statement that just sort of reminds everyone of, of what the framework is and how we're going to go through the presentation. Uh, and I remind you while we're going doing that, you are in a role, we are in a role, and, and remind us what our role is as we begin, okay? So my name is Kevin Harrington. I, I live north of Chicago. Uh, I'm the director of uh, supply chain for a, a mid-sized pharmaceutical company. Um, Hi, my name is Ray Gilbert. I'm the director of compliance for Velcro Group Corporation, which is the global servicing arm for the Velcro industry family of companies that make Velcro brand hook and loop product around the world. I oversee compliance and ethics, uh, environmental health and safety, and product regulatory compliance. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lonely one. Wow. Uh, yeah, you and what are you? Uh, <laughs> That's what I say every day. What are you? <laughs> uh, my name is John Trussler. I'm the director of ethics and business content for BAE Systems. And BAE Systems is the third largest global defense company in the world. It's a great show. <clears throat> so, my name is Marshall Miller. I'm a second year TCL student, and I'm working on novel neuropsychopharmacological agents. I'm Grace. I'm also a PhD student at Oxford. I study underwater image processing. I'm Casey. I'm a DPhil student at Oxford in my first year doing Buddhist ethics. Okay, um, let me read a short statement. Okay, so in this part of the competition, you are taking on a fictional business identity and assigning a fictional business identity judges. Please make sure everyone knows who you are and who they are before you begin. You will have 25 minutes, I'll say five minute cushion, to describe the legal, financial, and ethical dimensions of the problem and recommend a solution that passes muster on all three counts. During this time, teams will be uninterrupted. When you're finished, the judges will ask you questions for about 20 minutes. I will ask the first question and then turn it over to the other judges. During the Q&A, both you and the judges Reminded to stay in character as our scenario is ongoing. After the QA, the judges will give you feedback outside the role playing. Some important things to keep in mind. The ethical aspects of your analysis are the most important part. However, these should be described in simple, practical, common sense fashion using technical, philosophical terminology or basing your argument on religious or theological grounds will be considered a serious weakness. Similarly, any member of the team reading his or her part will also be considered a major mistake. Although you may use notes, uh, during this presentation, every member of the team must have some sort of speaking role. Okay. Great. So we're the team from the University of Oxford, but today we'll be presenting to you um, where we're acting um, as a consultancy group, and you are hopefully um, playing the role of the Board of Directors of SeaWorld Entertainment. So today we'd like to present a business package to you as the Board of Directors at SeaWorld, which we believe has the capacity fundamentally to transform the way in which um, the theme parks are run, and also which would help SeaWorld become a business which leads in the um, industry of animal entertainment both in terms of technological creativity, but also in terms of pursuing a new and more ethical direction for the business and for the future of SeaWorld. With me to present the package are Harshmina and Grace. So my name is Harshmina and I will be introducing some of the technologies we believe will be innovative in all parks. And again, I'm Grace. I'll also be presenting some of the business aspects and I'll also go over the legal implications of our proposed solution. And my role, it will be to give an outlay of the ethical motivation which really underpins
underpins this um, proposal and suggests that public opinion has changed so much over the last 40 years with respect to the ethics of keeping marine mammals in captivity that there is both a financial but also an ethical imperative for SeaWorld fundamentally to change its business model. So, um, I'd like to take you back to the past and um, to SeaWorld's beginnings with its original vision that it had for its um, organisation. Grace is now going to play a commercial which was from the 1980s. just um, it was its main vision was to provide a fun family day out and it wanted to offer an experience which was completely novel we believe that um, SeaWorld promoted itself as the facilitator of these novel experiences with orcas as, as the um, clip just showed and that it actually succeeded very well in meeting that objective which is attested by the fact that it is now a company of multi-billion multi dollar proportions. And that advertisement really captures the original goal. Unfortunately, however, recent years have seen a decline in SeaWorld's popularity. While to be sure there do remain a large number of um, loyal customers and supporters of the company, there's an increasing awareness and uneasiness associated with the very idea of keeping marine mammals in captivity for human purposes and entertainment. So in 2013, um, a documentary called Blackfish was launched, and this harrowing documentary follows the life of Tillicum, one of SeaWorld's most valuable assets, and who has unfortunately um, instigated a series of brutal attacks on some of the human trainers at SeaWorld and has personally taken the lives of three humans. So I'd like to talk you through this graph which captures the share price um, for these years. Um, in July 2013 the share prices were $38. Um, that marks the point at which Blackfish was released exactly a year to the day after, the share prices had dropped dramatically to a mere $18. And since that time, SeaWorld has never fully recovered. But in um, March this year, on the 17th of March, um, SeaWorld made some announcements regarding um, the phasing out of the Orca theatrical shows, but also the announcement that they would end their breeding program. And we see a slight upward trend, but it still hasn't fully recovered. What this graph demonstrates is that there is a discernible and clear correlation between announcements considered to be ethically progressive and the ethics of the, of the dynamic that SeaWorld is um, presenting and the um, equitable value. Because of this, we wish to offer a different business package one in which SeaWorld is able to return to the original vision of offering a fun family day out, but also to expand and enhance that experience by making the, the, um, the parks a focal point, not just for family fun, but for education and conservational purposes. So Harshmina will now um, run you through the particulars of this proposal. So as ambassadors of marine conservation, SeaWorld now has the opportunity to pioneer a global revolution in the way we experience animals. Now, SeaWorld has always promoted an engagement with animals, and so perhaps there is a paradox at the heart of our proposal, which is in fact closer encounters with marine animals, whilst removing orcas from SeaWorld's live shows altogether. Now, technology is expanding at a rapid pace, and many things are now possible that were deemed totally unfeasible even one to two decades ago. 
and uh, today some of these impossibilities are rising to the occasion in the form of virtual and augmented reality. Now before I go into the details of what exactly virtual and augmented reality are, it should be noted that famed Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg recently said that this is really a new communication platform. Imagine sharing not just moments with your friends online, but entire experiences and adventures. Now, utilising this technology, it could be possible to expand on current ideas. Um, I will now show an example of exactly what this could potentially entail. Again, the videos. So it should be noted that the purpose of this presentation is not to merely present a technical plan for how to implement these technologies, but we are here to highlight the realistic possibilities that these future, future technologies could entail. So first of all, it should be noted that augmented reality, or AR, and virtual reality, or VR, are very different types of technologies that offer very different experiences. So first of all, what is augmented reality? physical, real-world environment whose elements are augmented by computer inputs, whether this be sound or graphics and videos. Now, thanks to new technology, we now have stunning video footage of marine animals in the world that can be presented as holograms that fill a room um, and have the potential to replace the theatrical shows. Um, virtual reality, on the other hand, is a computer-generated simulation of a three-dimensional image that can be act interacted with in a seemingly real way using uh, headgear and or gloves fitted with sensors and this video gives you an idea of the types of, te the types of videos that the end user would be able to see through such headsets. Now whilst both technologies serve to exist the end user with an enhanced or enriched experience the key difference between the two is that virtual reality offers a digital recreation of a real-life setting, whilst augmented reality delivers the virtual elements as an overlay to the real-world setting. Now, virtual reality could be used additionally to give visitors a unique or inspiring experience that could prove to be even more educational than the newly proposed viewing tanks and uh, previously used live shows. So, the key experiential difference between augmented reality and virtual reality is that augmented reality can be enjoyed in an arena as a group experience, whereas virtual reality can be tailored to a more personal experience, based on age, for example, and therefore intelligence and interests. And augmented reality also has the option for audience participation in a similar manner to the current shows put on by our competitors over at Walt Disney and Universal Studios, um, uh, allowing the creation of these orca shows, but without the live orcas, with the potential use of additional 4D technology, such as the spraying of water and the vibration of chairs, again, in a similar manner to what our competitors are using. Um, and just a final point, to, um, just a few weeks ago, Microsoft released their new HoloLens technology, and this really does show uh, the potential of this type of technology as it, um, as it further blends the line between the digital and the real world. and cephalopods, our <coughs> solution does not change that and instead it just integrates with these rides already in the park. One thing though that the park might consider for 
in, to happen in the existing tanks would be to let visitors ride in these animal inspired watercraft, kind of like bumper cars inside the existing tanks. These vehicles could give the uh, visitor the sensation of diving in and out of the water like a whale and it's very interactive and fun. Another attraction to consider for in, to happen inside the existing tanks is to have flyboard shows. So these have become popular in Dubai. They um, and they could they would work in the existing tanks. It doesn't have to be in open water like the video shows. Professionals ride on these like water hovercrafts, and they can arc in and out of the water again, similar movements to the marine animals. And they can flip and do spins. It would create a splash zone, just like the shows with captive animals do now. And after the shows, visitors could pay extra to fly in tandem with one of the professionals, like in those photos there, um, to have again a really interactive and unique experience. So we've run through the numbers, and our solution is affordable. It makes sense from a business and financial perspective. There would need to be an initial investment um, to bring in the hardware necessary for the technology and bring in an engineering and design team. From then on, there's a maintenance fee, and then we'd suggest upgrading the technology and videos as time goes on. And we would predict then that profit would spike when a new show or technology comes out and then level off until the next upgrade. The initial investment would be on the order of tens of millions of dollars. It would involve putting together a core engineering and design team of say 20 people, each getting paid 200K US dollars per year as salary and average. And this team would then decide how to use the budget for hardware in the park for these virtual reality, artificial reality shows, and also a budget for produ producing its own shows. The, some of the SeaWorld trainers could be involved in the production of those shows, etc. Um, and it, it doesn't have to all happen at once. You see, we're able to release one show, see how it goes, take in that feedback, and continue to develop the shows and slowly replace the animal, the shows that they have with captive animals. Then maintenance fees are not too dissimilar to what the park experiences now. And finally, an upgrade doesn't cost nearly as much as putting in a new ride because once you have that, that's hardware in place for projecting holograms, etc. All it really is is changing the movie or the program on that system. There is a theme park near us in Oxford that has plans to release a virtual reality, artificial reality ride this summer. And um, although they haven't released the official numbers, they've said that it's an investment on the order of multi-million pounds. So our rough order of magnitude numbers here in the right ballpark. Now, SeaWorld has been facing quite a few legal battles in the last few years that have come in place after the death of one of its senior trainers in 2010. And, um, we think it's important that you understand what happened when she died, but part of the, the gruesome details. This trainer, in front of a live audience, was dragged repeatedly to the bottom of the pool. She was brought up with her arm and scalp yanked off, and nearly every bone in her body was fractured again, all in front of a live audience. And after that horrific incident, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration ruled that SeaWorld had violated the general clause of their act by endangering the human trainers. And since then, they have uh, required SeaWorld to place a physical barrier between the trainers and the whales. And this means that SeaWorld cannot run the shows like it used to, where their trainers were riding with the whales in the tank or balancing on the whale's noses, et cetera. So something, something needs to change. SeaWorld did appeal that ruling, but it was upheld. And fun fact, the judge that upheld the ruling has now been nominated by Obama to be a Supreme Court judge. Then there's ongoing legal battles that SeaWorld is facing. Um, for There's been many claims brought forward that accuses SeaWorld essentially of false advertising. They liken the case to that in the tobacco industry. They say if there was a warning on SeaWorld tickets or commercials saying that those whales are almost treated like slaves or unhappy, despite what looks like a smile on their face, that visitors wouldn't want to buy as many tickets. That case has been dismissed. Uh, the court has said SeaWorld doesn't need to disclose how it treats its workers, just like other companies do, but that could change. We as a company, SeaWorld as a company, needs to look forward and kind of adapt to these changes um, in, 
in the future. And also that case that talked about SeaWorld, the quality of its animals, how that should be presented, that was the first time that animals' constitutional rights was brought up in a U.S. court. So thing, things are changing. Now, our solution, it addresses the previous and ongoing legal issues, and it presents surmountable legal issues. For example, the rides would have to have a warning saying if you have epilepsy or certain other kinds of conditions, the ride might not be right for you. There would need to be ways to escape the experience if you feel necessary, but these are very standard for theme parks and any competent legal team could put those together in a really standard way. Also, if we're using Magic Leap or Microsoft HoloLens for commercial purposes, we need to draw up appropriate contracts for that, but again, that is very standard and could be addressed by any competitive legal team. And not only does our solution address the legal issues, but it provides SeaWorld the opportunity to transform its brand and please not only its loyal supporters, but also people who are now its critics and skeptics. And it reframes the discussion about how we use animals for entertainment globally. It's also incredibly timely. Now is the time for SeaWorld to do this. The sequel to Finding Nemo, Finding Dory, is coming out this summer, and they've released that it will have a very strong anti-captivity message. And we're using some of those videos we showed of new technologies. Those have only been released weeks ago. It's very new technology, and now is prime time for SeaWorld to be investing in it. And then there's a unique selling point, which is that you come to the park, you have a unique experience. It's educational. It's ecological, it's something that can only happen in SeaWorld. We can also, as we've, we've decided to stop breeding orcas at the park, but those orcas can be moved to sea pens that, where the orcas have better living conditions and visitors could pay for a VIP experience to visit those orcas as we're slowly phasing out the shows. Our business plan is really rooted in the concept that SeaWorld has the opportunity, a unique opportunity, to lead the way and to set an example to the animal entertainment industry in its treatment of animals and by adopting more ethically acceptable practices and standards. Um, at the global level, we've noted that there is um, a big consensus that things need to change. Um, SeaWorld doesn't have any parks or um, investments in India, but in India recently, in 2013, the government announced that um, the building of new dolphinariums was illegal and that um, eventually plans would be put in place to phase out the captivity of dolphins. So we see that this is a global movement happening at the moment. Um, the growing unity in public opinion over the issue of keeping whales and dolphins um, captive for the purpose of providing human entertainment is now widely attested. And the extent and the impact of the documentary Blackfish could be regarded as unprecedented and unexpected. Um, that's certainly how the film's director understands the situation. Um, the ramifications of Blackfish um, seem to continue because recently um, the there's been a government and public liaison um, where the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, has commissioned um, APHIS, who are the um, United States um, Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, to um, undertake an assessment and um, to, propose, to come up with proposals as to how we can better comply with the um, Animal Welfare Act. So there's certainly a call for revisions to the current standards. <clears throat> so this has um, come about as recently as the 29th of January this year, and um, APHIS has invited comments from the general public on the acceptability of proposed, proposed revisions to the Animal Welfare Act concerning the humane handling, care, and treatment of marine animals in captivity. These proposals include water treatment and bacteria levels, accessibility to sufficient shaded areas, air quality in indoor facilities, compliance with the Animal Welfare Act reg regulations on interaction, which would include things such as swimming with dolphins, and the amount of time animals should spend on display versus without public interaction. This is probably going to be the first of um, many revisions because the current standards haven't been revised since 1998. So this, you know, it's likely that given the public um, changing consensus towards this issue that there'll be more um, revisions. 
It's also noteworthy that at the moment, if, this, if these proposals were introduced tomorrow, SeaWorld wouldn't be compliant with them. That applies particularly to the level of bacteria in the water. It's estimated that up to um, the bacteria levels are up to four times as high as they actually should be. And um, Tillicum, the whale responsible for the deaths of the three people we spoke about earlier, is actually um, expected to die soon as a result of a serious bacterial lung infection. So um, whilst the majority of the proposals have, have been well received by organisations such as the Whale and Dolphin Conservation Charity, there has been a mixed reaction as well because unfortunately um, increasing the amount of time that it's possible to interact with whales and dolf um, with dolphins in particular from two to three hours also was featured in that proposal, so they've actually increased that amount of time. And sadly, um, calls to increase the pool dimensions haven't been needed. So whilst working to the new AP standards is a, a good starting point and it's very crucial to SeaWorld's recovery after the um, fallout of Blackfish documentary, it's not in itself sufficient for that recovery and it also doesn't safeguard um, the rights of the animals for whom they are responsible. So, um, given that it does remain, uh, SeaWorld does remain in a state of recovery um, since, the, since Blackfish, we think that our proposed virtual reality technology um, offers a real alternative and is not just financially prudent but is also essential to that process of recovery in terms of its public image. Um, if SeaWorld is serious about the recent announcements both to end the breeding program of the orcas and to phase out the theatrical um, shows, it must move with the times and that involves responding to public opinion and to search for new and profitable avenues for its um, expansion. So I'd like to talk through a number of welfare concerns that, um, that ground this proposal, I suppose. The effects, both psychological and physical, of keeping marine um, mammals in captivity are becoming increasingly better understood as the scientific um, evidence is helping us to understand that the social complexity of the lives of whales and dolphins is very complex and very vast. Um, at the time when SeaWorld was founded, um, there wasn't so much scientific knowledge about the social complexity of these creatures' lives. But the claim to total ignorance is at the same time masking a willful naivety because even at the time, decades ago, the pioneering biological and marine conservationist Jacques Cousteau said about the captivity, of, um, captivity for dolphins that it leads to a confusion of the entire sensory apparatus which in turn causes in such a sensitive creature a derangement of mental balance and behaviour. So SeaWorld has really reached um, a fork in the road where one way can lead to reorientation of attitudes of empathy and respect for marine life and the other could lead to greater alienation from a public who's becoming increasingly uncomfortable with the idea of using animals in this way for the purpose of human entertainment. The findings of scientists also show that um, the kind of specialised environment that an orca or a dolphin requires in order to flourish and the kind of um, environment that the SeaWorld context is able to offer are just incompatible. So here's um, a quote from Dr. Michael Hutchins, who is the direct, was the former um, director of the Conservation and Science Association for Zoos and Aquariums between 1990 and 2005. He says that those providing veterinary care don't have the proper credentials or the training or certification, and that there's a clear pattern of preventable mortality as a result of factors controlled by zoo managers including such things as exposures to toxins, um, extreme temperatures, injuries due to inappropriate social structure, starvation, poor nutrition, poor water quality, etc. So, um, this is a, a video which I'm, I'm going to talk through. So, whilst being held captive might be deeply distressing for any creature. In the case of orcas and dolphins, it's quite
quite apparent that in practically every respect they're unable to flourish as a, whilst in captivity. I've already mentioned the complexity and cohesiveness of their social structures, but it's important to really emphasize this. The stimulation um, available in the sea world context does not even approach anywhere near the scale that they would experience in the wild. And it's been calculated that in order to um, get the same kind of exercise they would have in the wild, they would need to circulate the pool as many as 1,400 times every single day just to cover the distance they would naturally be equipped to. Circulation on that kind of scale is always associated with the onset of psychosis induced by confinement, which unfortunately is so frequently found across the industry that a neologism has been um, developed in order to express the idea, and that, that's zoocosis. Um, the training methods that have been used previously by SeaWorld are also very ethically questionable. They've included things such as the withholding of food and um, isolation of individual whales and dolphins from one another, which is something that would never happen to them in the wild. They would stay within their pods. And um, so this shows that at an industry-wide level, the practices are not just um, misguided, but could also be reasonably um, shown to be both manipulative and cruel. So, Yeah, so I'd like to end really just by focusing on what the ultimate effects of captivity could be summed up as. So firstly, for, um, for the, for the um, orcas, um, there's a drastically reduced lifespan in captivity. 92% of SeaWorld's orcas fail to live beyond 25 years. In the wild, a female would live up to 50 years. Um, that's on average, but they have been known to live up to 80. And the males can live up to 30 years as well. There's been um, a lot of traumatizing experiences for these whales, um, including the weaning techniques between a mother and its calf. While SeaWorld claims that that process isn't rushed, the reality is that in the wild, that process would never occur. Um, the calf would stay with its mother the whole life. Um, as part of the family group. The effects of zoocosis have, I've, as I've just explained, have been traumatizing and terrible for the animals, but I don't think we should neglect to focus in on the fact that zoocosis is often very much associated with acts of aggression. And this has clear links to the fact that four humans have actually died as a result of, of captivity and engagement with these animals, three of which were in SeaWorld's parks here, and another in Loro Park. Um, the final point I'd like to make is a um, very brief one about the dorsal collapse. You can see on these two pictures that the captive whale um, has a collapsed flopped over fin, which um, is thought to occur in almost 100% of SeaWorld's male um, orcas but actually occurs in just 1% of natural free-living animals. It's connected with um, swimming in waters of insufficient depth and general lack of activity as well. So just one final point. We agree that the orca is central to the brand name of SeaWorld. And we agree that the SeaWorld experience includes the orca experience, something that only we can provide in an ethical manner. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Um, my, my first question, we were speaking exclusively about orcas in, in our SeaWorld parks. Are, are, is there any merit value or reason for us to think about other animals in our parks in a different way and or uh, change the practice of how we uh, house, train, care for, interact with, and so on, the other, the other animals in SeaWorld parks? Yeah, we've looked into the prospect um, of moving perhaps the orcas to sea pens. Um, and we hope that um, this will be part of a gradual movement towards SeaWorld's um, adoption of more ethically sustainable values that fall in accordance with the public's perception on the treatment of sharks, dolphins, and sea lions. But, um, you know, there have been deaths of other creatures in SeaWorld's care, like sea lions and stingrays. So we see this as um, one of the sort of turning points, the momentous turning point that SeaWorld has the opportunity to pioneer 
the way it treats orcas, but that's just the first part of the process, certainly not the end goal. We want to see this take off as a, a movement in our treatment of, of seagulls animals. And it makes sense to start with the orcas as they are beginning with the heart of the brand, and they have received the most media attention at least since after 2013 in the release of live fish. But you're saying the end goal is to get rid of all live animals and seagulls? Well, but we also want to emphasise that um, we want to keep um, developing um, and enable SeaWorld to develop um, a narrative which is based on the principles of ecology and conservation. It already invests quite a lot of money into um, the practices of cons conservative practices, so um, they do a lot of conservational work at the moment. They could, there's a lot of reason to suggest that people could get behind that. So. Um, if we move in the direction of using augmented reality or virtual reality as the core technology and, and um, entertainment um, venue for our customers, how do we remain a unique uh, entertainment alternative? Some of the, um, at least one of the uh, videos you showed us show people engaging in these activities in their homes. Isn't there every reason to believe that as the technology progresses, the need to go somewhere to enjoy this um, entertainment experience is going to uh, dry up? And in that case, what happens to all our assets, real estate, and the business proposition of the, <coughs> of the company as a whole? I think there's two sides to this. So first of all, um, SeaWorld is in a unique position in that it can walk give you a business package. It can give you not just virtual reality and augmented reality, it can give you an educational message, a conservational message, and uh, that's what puts it in a unique position. It's also at the forefront of um, the business in that it has these trainers which have these unique experiences with these orcas, and so we could almost use them as a voice for the orcas. So we are in a very unique position. Um, with regards to the technology, whilst it appears as though it might be um, available in households and, and apparently schools, it's actually a little bit more complex. So these are just some examples. So um, the, uh, the build-up of the sensors required and the machinery is actually quite complex, and these are very small scale, and we could do a lot more with the money that SeaWorld has as a multi-million dollar business. So, so like right now that whale hologram that jumped through the gymnasium, that could only happen with quite a sophisticated setup that would have to happen in an auditorium. But maybe 10 years that could happen in your home. And I think it would be great if SeaWorld had already developed these shows and could produce these and sell these through other avenues, not just as parks like later on. So there's a lot of ways to, to innovate. Uh, I'm sorry. It would seem we're shifting uh, sort of the mission and approach of, of SeaWorld's business model away from a unique entertainment uh, uh, experience to one that's much more focused on uh, education and, and leverage of unique technology as a mechanism by which folks can interact in a different way or not interact right, um, with, with uh, sea, sea mammals and other animals which otherwise are relatively inaccessible uh, uh, for much of the world. Do I understand correctly? And, and consequently, what, what are the risks in, in shifting that business model substantially by your recommending? So I think the first point is that by releasing these orcas into sea pens, which is what we're proposing, we're actually allowing the business to expand because we could organize unique visits, trips, and uh, SeaWorld could actually create a small hub around these sea pens to increase its business. Um, and that's something that only SeaWorld could do. SeaWorld is in a unique position. It still owns these orcas, um, and so it can have the opportunity to um, uh, organize uh, VIP trips, for example, to actually move these orcas in the world in their natural uh, or more natural setting. But also the core is still that you go to SeaWorld to have an entertaining, amazing experience. Like you see the whale jumping through, even if it's a hologram, not real, you get a sense of wow. And the, but now they can't do that the way that they're running business as usual with the whales. Now their trainers need to be separated by a barrier and protesters are outside most of the parks during the day. So we need to change something in order to stay viable at all. Mm -hmm. I think I'd like to add as well that while there may be risks involved in any 
reorientation of a business, I think the risks for SeaWorld are far greater if they don't change because as the graph um, showed in the drop of share prices, people are very perceptive of um, SeaWorld's treatment and the ethical treatment of the animals. There's a lot of media attention on it yeah. and it shows that that media attention has the capacity to detract people from going to SeaWorld based on the way that the public perceives the treatment of animals. Um, if SeaWorld doesn't change that, then business will fall away. So I think the risks would be greater for staying the same. And this could have the potential to broaden the consumer base. We could attract uh, people who are interested in modern mm -hmm. technologies, for example, and you could even potentially advertise it in such a way that by saying something like, by coming to uh, SeaWorld Entertainment theme parks, you're actually helping these orcas to be free in the world. And that's a very, very good twist on what's actually happening. So it's a, uh, as a board member, you think I'd know this, but are we making a profit now? No. So actually, uh, so I have the facts, but according to the financial report of the end of last year, SeaWorld has decreased the number of people attending its theme parks by 100,000, where the main attraction, SeaWorld Orlando, has seen a drop of 400,000 and um, SeaWorld Florida is in the top 25 of all the theme parks in the United States, um, but it is the only theme park to show a decrease in profits of all the theme parks where our competitors, um, Disney was number one, Walt Disney um, Magic Kingdom, followed by Universal Studios, which also saw increase in profits in the range of 5-10%, to 10 according to the financial report. So SeaWorld is actually... So as a corporation, we are losing money. Yes. Or, or Something not. needs to change. Okay. Um, so let me also then. It's, it sounds like that the if, if you're tying the health of the corporation back to public perception of the company and how we treat the animals and the overall change in attitude towards that treatment of the animals. Um, I guess what I'd like you to expand upon a little bit is. In other words, if everyone in the room here agreed something, that the fact that we all agree that we all vote for one thing isn't necessarily a moral argument. So I, I understand from a business perspective how a decline, how a change in attitudes about morality and about ethics has impacted our bottom line. But say more about what the arguments for and against this. In other words, 10 years ago, as a society, we all felt that this was morally acceptable. Now, as a society, we believe that this is morally unacceptable. And I'm trying to figure out, yes, I agree that the perceptions have changed, but what are, why are the what arguments are now different? You see what I'm asking? Yeah, so yeah. Um, it's not merely that we want to conform with the new conventions. We actually want to see what, you know, because the convention has changed 10 years ago. There was still some um, public outcry of what was going on, but far more now. We don't want SeaWorld merely to conform with the new conventions. We want to see it progress beyond that, which is why eventually we'd like the sea pens to be used for other creatures that they have. The arguments in favour of change, I think, are, you know, you could classify them in three ways. Firstly, you could take into account the change um, in attitude towards um, our treatment of different species. There's been arguments put forward, for example, by Peter Singer, along the lines that simply to um, disregard the considerations of some creature that doesn't belong to our own species is not morally justifiable and not also sustainable as a, as a philosophical argument. The second strand is you could just consider it on a compassion basis and actually that in itself has like two lines coming from it. The treatment of the animals has really traumatizing effects on their mental well-being and the onset of zoocosis. But I think we really should focus on the fact that disregarding the arguments for speciesism and that kind of thing, four people have actually died. Mm -hmm. The lady lost her arm got bitten off, her scalp got bitten off. Like, there's a very clear like human anthropocentric reason why, why this kind of engagement is dangerous. I think too it's hard. Those whales, they look like they're smiling all the time, they're happy music, they're jumping through hoops. It, it looks like they're having fun being playful. But now we understand that they are being tortured. They, um, the, the space that Tilikum is in, that tank, is 0.0001% the quantity of water he would traverse in a single day in nature. And they've 
SeaWorld is um, they're not being able to capture orcas from the wild now, so they've done an artificial insemination. They forced a male to breed with his mother. That separation procedure, taking with the Catherine's mother, has been so traumatic that they've had to give both whales Valium just so that they will stop thinking out. I think now it is very clear that those whales are <coughs> miserable. They are not able to fulfill their greatest potential. We're treating them like little slaves. I think as well, like taking into consideration that zoos and aquariums have a, an ethical obligation to preserve the gene pool and keep their sort of genes um, mixed well. There's an international breeding program where usually um, zoo, um, animals that have to be in one zoo would have to mate with an animal that have to be in another zoo. So they didn't introduce that kind of genetic um, inbreeding. And uh, there's, a, there's a lot of arguments, especially with um, you know, the sort of impact of, of, um, of, of changes that are taking place across the world where we're seeing declines in the numbers of orcas in the wild. We really have a duty to preserve that gene pool, I'd say. Uh, two more questions dealing with the two stakeholder groups here. One is the orcas themselves. You made a statement, we have an obligation to the orcas, we own the orcas, we'll put them in sea pens. And now that sensibilities are changing, is that an ethical response, sufficiently ethical response? Do they not belong in the wild? Do they really belong to us? Can we, even if we believe it, can we take that position and risk that evolving social mores about animal ownership um, are going to quickly compel another change, of course? Or should we be more um, forward looking than you're suggesting? And the second part is, there are an existing group of workers. We haven't discussed them as well. You're talking about bringing in high-tech workers to provide high-tech services, but we have hundreds, if not thousands, of people that work in traditional jobs. What's going to happen to them, and what what approach is reasonable, moral, and ethical with respect to our existing workforce? So, if I take the first point, sure. Um, the reason we can't release these workers back into the wild, which is a widely debated issue, is because they were bred in captivity, and so they don't have the mental and behavioral capabilities to survive in the wild. Um, there is a very high probability that if we do release them into the, the wild, they will probably die. Whereas in our, cons um, in our sea pens, they have a greater chance of thriving with, um, compared to their current location in these limited size tanks. Um, and just to add to that, orcas in the wild survive in pods and just because these orcas have been um, housed together, they are not necessarily from the same pod and so if we release them into the wild, again, they're not going to be able to survive because they don't have the pods and it's the reason they survive is because they exist in such numbers in the wild and even if they were to find their original pod, it's been 40 years at least, there's no saying that their original pods will accept them and again the eventual outcome will be um, ultimately death. And I'll take the second question. I don't think our, our workforce would change substantially. You have your, the core design team, but still maintaining and running all those attractions, even if it's running the, the hologram projections. That all takes a considerable workforce in the park. And the people letting people on and off rides, that doesn't change. Cleaners at the park, again, doesn't change. People welcoming people in, doesn't change. And then we'd like to use our existing trainers and people who like working with animals to feature in the productions and films that SeaWorld will be putting into virtual reality <coughs> program form. They are really, they know animals so well, and they're comfortable with the animals in the water. They can film these shows in the wild, go out on boats, and they'll still be very much part of the production process. I guess I, maybe I'll just ask just an inch for my own interest. After, um, I never saw the movie, right? But during the movie and certainly during the time where trainers were being injured, what was the trainer's response? Did we have trouble hiring trainers? Actually, SeaWorld didn't expose to all its trainers what had actually happened. So, for example, the um, first woman who was killed, uh, Kelsey Burns by Tilikum, her death wasn't actually um, explained to the other trainers. It was merely explained as an accident. 
um, she slipped and fell into the pool and it was only uh, later where Coppel Thwait, the director, kind of dug a little bit more. We found out, we found footage and saw that actually he grabbed her foot and pulled her into the pool. And you could see it in the film. There's some trainers now that have quit and have been very vocal, like at SeaWorld, saying that, yes, we were, we were completely unaware that there were all these misses and that things that were for these accidents were in fact very intentional by the workers. Um, and and again, there's footage. You can see the yeah. workers lunging at the trainers. Yeah, I mean, the, like, each park has maybe a dozen trainers, so and I think if they need to get more, there wasn't any shortage of people who want to be trainers. Thank you very much. I thought you guys did a great job. Right off the top. The way you answer questions, the way you uh, interact between the three of you, uh, it, it, I, I have no idea how long you've been doing this, but I would believe you've been doing it for a while, at least as long as a SeaWorld trainer has been out there doing the day every day. Um, in particular, your your approach where you answer all the questions, that you know, I can't recall, Trevor John asked, you said one, two, three, and then you went right through it. It's a very effective mechanism by which you uh, make a point and do so in a convincing uh, balance away. So I, 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 that takes a long time to figure out. I don't do it well myself, uh, unless I'm lecturing one of my children. Um, anyway, a co couple of things. I, I really, by, by the way, I should mention something right away. If you're not aware of it, the man who runs this program um, wrote a book on the ethical treatment of marine mammals. Yeah, he came and spoke out <laughs> Okay, okay, good, yes. Uh, in fact, I met him at Oxford one time and he was there in Cairo. So that's okay, so that's good, you know about that. Um, so I encourage you, if you haven't, uh, it's not like you have, you can talk about what you're, you're discussing. Um, clearly in the case of SeaWorld, they're at, they're at a reflection point in the, in the sphere of their business. Uh, it sounds like they're on an inevitable irreversible decline unless they make some form of recommendations or some form of change in their business model. Uh, I don't really see how that would change unless they're going to submit their business model and put it in the parts of the world that are emerging and evolving and can sustain the type of revenue they can offer. Um, but the only thing I would make a suggest, suggestion about is organization. Um, when you when you do a presentation, and I'm as guilty of this as anybody, you this, this is not stress is enough. You, your your presentation is for your your audience. So always always focus on how you make it easier for your audience to follow your discussion, your argument, and, and be consistent with their expectations. So if you can talk about the legal, the ethical, the financial pieces. In the logical sequence and follow their your recommendations. Okay. And as John pointed out earlier, always give the business options and, and make and possibly consider you know, three or four different ways to, to address the issue. You know, and, and one of the issues is all one of the options is always to do nothing option. You can always just sustain and keep doing what you're doing and maybe it just get better. Um, but I, I think I thought you did just an excellent job of being very comfortable answering questions. I said I thought to myself, I don't think we asked them a question that they had handled before or seen before. Um, the, the use of the stock chart, which is very effective, people tend to want to use those kinds of illustrations, but they, but they create more complexity in questions than they answer, so I thought that was a good job of doing that. Um, and I also thought the legal part of your, of your um, case um, was not obvious, um, and I thought you did a decent job of using the OSHA example and, and also uh, discussing I caught myself wondering, was that, is that an actual organization? Um, I don't know what's the number. Oh, A P H I S. It is yeah, actual. Yeah, Excellent. Yeah, yeah. And I thought that was very good as well. It's, it's, it falls under the division of the USDA. Okay, you may want to explain that um, because, uh, again, uh, connecting connecting an organization like that leaves the impression this could just be an industry organization or possibly a concerned citizen organization versus uh, something that's part of a government entity and creates laws and enforces laws. Well, congratulations on an outstanding presentation. Um, I thought of the three that I've heard this morning, I thought you guys sort of got gifted with the best topic. It's the one in which the ethical issues are the clearest, the path forward is the clearest, the financial components are the clearest, but um, you handled all of them expertly, I thought. Uh, this was the first presentation in which the, all of the topics, the legal, financial, and ethical topics were thoroughly covered. And uh, I thought you were all articulate in your presentation, which was terrific. 
Uh, I appreciated the fact that the slide presentation was uniform, which it has not been in other circumstances, which is a distraction. And so the fact that they all had the same header really worked well for me. Um, I thought just in terms of your individual performances, I thought you all used a terrific pace uh, in your presentations. Um, and uh, some suggestions that, or, or things that, that I might have expected or that I think, we'll just call them opportunities to think about ways in which you might uh, improve. In terms of organization, you brought forward the solution which was very compelling, and then you told. Then at the end, I, I understood why I really needed to go for that solution. So I would have put the bad cop first. You made such a compelling demonstration of the ethical, the clear ethical choice that needs to be made. That then it becomes even easier to accept and embrace a sound um, financial proposal. Uh, I would have put it first because it, it just if that's organizationally that would have made more sense for me. Um, I think that you are all so well versed in the subject matter, you can rely less on your notes and engage more with the audience, maybe step out from the lectern. Uh, I don't know, that could be a cultural or personal style, but you spoke in, in so clearly and with such reliance, a little bit of clear reliance on your notes that you sacrificed a little bit in terms of engagement to make that perfect presentation. And it was perfect, but somehow the engagement has to suffer when you look at your script so much. Um, uh, and it adds kind of an earnestness to your presentation that's absent when, when, or that's not as pronounced when you are relying on your outline or notes. Um, I, uh, two other very small things. One, if you're going to refer to Obama, I think depending on your audience, you should use the term President Obama. Uh, just because we're in the United States, he is our president. It's probably the right approach, not knowing what your audience uh, expects. And the other is the compelling uh, argument that you made, to me, wasn't enhanced by a, a detailed description of the injury and death of the woman. I, I, I wasn't sure that you needed that to make a compelling tale. It seemed not gratuitous necessarily, but it, it didn't enhance the financial, ethical, or business proposition that you were making. So I don't know if you need it, I guess I would say. But, but overall, really excellent presentation. Uh, I, I would love to listen to you all day. Uh, I have a couple of, of thoughts. So the first, I think I echo what the other uh, guys have said. I also wrote down, uh, do the scary stuff first, and then tell me how you're going to solve the scary stuff. It sounds, if you're asking me as a board member to scuttle over the next 10 years, scuttle everything that um, SeaWorld has done and move into being an entirely different company, I really need to be convinced on the outset that there's a real problem that I'm trying to solve. Um, I think you addressed some of that a lot better during the questions and answers, and I think a lot of that came out. So uh, specifically, one of the things would be um, and again, I asked this question, you guys did a great job explaining it, but when it comes to finance, it's just showing the stock price to me is one part of the data, but I, as a board member, the stock price is totally, I know firsthand that it's totally detached from whether or not I'm making money or not. It has everything to do with perception and perspective and maybe my own personal income, but it has very little to do with the corporation's overall health. So, well, it has something with Relatively speaking, I wanted to know what you answered, which is whether or not we're making money, and if an investor had a choice to go with somebody else, what would they have done made over that same period of time? And you answered that, and that, but to me as a board member, that's what I really wanted to know. I, this is just an observation. I felt like a lot of your arguments were very emotionally based, and another way to say it is that you were very passionate about your topic, and I think that's great. And of course, you were, uh, you were passionate, and it brought me along in your presentation. But when I look over even the summary and in the way that you presented it, a lot of the words that you use are emotionally charged words that are also summary words. So you told me that it was cruel, and you told me that this is progressive, and you told me that this was um, torturous treatment. Um, and th but those are emotional words. Those aren't arguments in and of themselves. Okay? They're, they're your perception of the arguments and of the reality, but they're not the actual arguments. 
so, and, and again, another similar example to that would be where you said that you know, there's a unity of public opinion. I'm like, okay, good, that's a good summary statement, but that's not a moral argument, okay, just because we all agree. We all agreed it was fine before. If that's your argument, well, it was fine before. So what's changed? Tell me how the argument's changed. So I, uh, I guess I would, I would say that when you were questioned about those things, you did a much better job of getting granular and saying, okay, here's, here's what we think the arguments are that lead to this summary. But again, if you're asking me to change the entire framework of how I, I kind of need to understand what the actual arguments are versus what your take on those arguments are. So, does that make sense? Yes, thank yeah. you. Yeah, and I, I think John's points are excellent for a couple of reasons. Inevitably, when you have, if you're talking to one person, that you, you can focus on and understand how to influence one person. When you influence a group, particularly when you don't know it all, effectively you have to use different techniques that says um, facts, data, uh, emotion, passion, uh, something that can turn into provocative. Uh, and, and a combination of those things can, can add better weight and depth uh, to, to make a point. Let me add one, one more thing okay. to that, and that is uh, I, I, your argument would be stronger if you acknowledge the validity of the opposing view. Okay, so in other words, there is a very strong opposing view. There are people still going to SeaWorld every day who enjoy it. There are members of the board who are invested in the way that we have gone and done things for the last two decades, three decades, however long. And we have a moral position, whatever that is. It may be wrong, but I think at some point you have to say, um, I have understood that these are the arguments for why we have a first person experience where people can touch the animals and this, this is why we believe there's value in that. We recognize that argument and the validity of your argument, but here's why we think that this other argument is a stronger argument. I think then you go, okay, I, I can see how I can get from where I am to where I'm going. But your, your presentation was, uh, again, very passionate and I think very long tension, but it didn't take you know, somebody who disagreed with you into your position. Uh, okay. Um, last two things. You're very articulate. Don't lose that. Okay. You, you distinguish yourselves from your competition, and you will continue to benefit and build up persuasiveness, um, reflect style consideration, and nuance in your arguments. The other is in the videos you used. Um, they were sort of they were sort of cutting edge. Was one hand, they didn't project, which I, I'm guessing that was intention. Obviously, would work better. Um, so, if, if your technology and presentation isn't working like you expect, it can be a distraction as opposed to better. Um, anyway, but you have to kind of wing that as you go. At the same time, you didn't create a distraction out of it by taking five minutes to try to fix it. So, I think you held that well enough. Good. Excellent. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.